And you named a whole movie rating system about it in your previous that's, incarnations. That's right. Not uh, uh, yeah. We used to do this when we used to review movies a long time ago. At another site, I was at we we would you know say whether it was good, but then we would judge a movie on three different scales. It was either no go or Ralph. <laughs> and uh, no was no no don't go see it. Go was go go see it. But here's where Ralph comes from. There was a story about a few months into the filming of the last Superman film that Warner Brothers, some execs at Warner Brothers, were uncomfortable. With the size of the bulge <laughs> in in Ralph's pants, wearing the tights, and they actually went in and had it digitally reduced. Guess who's not uncomfortable with? <laughs> <laughs> and so we we were talking about this story, and we were joking, and it's like, yeah, Ralph's the, he's got the package; he's the complete package, and that that kind of just became our standard of a movie of excellence, a movie that is the whole package. Mm. And so we said a movie is either no, go, or Ralph. And, and that's how that one went. Anyway, so let's uh, let's move on to the next topic of conversation here. Yeah, for a non-issue topic, that certainly went, went pretty yeah, lively. Went pretty... Oh, wait, we didn't hear Dennis. Oh, oh I, I was just going to go with uh, Ralph. I knew it would never happen. He was, the, you know, one of the few bright spots in Superman Returns. That was a pretty bad movie, I disagree. in my opinion. <laughs> I really like Superman Returns. I, I did. But I'm one of those guys who I got why people didn't like it at the same time. Like, I, I walked out going, okay, I know a lot of people are going to like this, but I freaking love this The Lex, Lex Luthor character was totally... It was horrible. They destroyed his character. I, I kind of like the direction they oh, went with them. I just think the movie's too long. It's got one too many of those, like, let's see what kryptonite does on Earth scenes, like yeah, where agreed. it blows up stuff. Agreed. But, I you know, I just think it's like 15 minutes too long. And what I like about that movie is that is that Brian Singer made, like, a $200 million, like, indie relationship drama <laughs> that happened to be about Superman. I mean, like, that's it's what it is to me. Film. It's a Like, you know, film. because I think, like, that whole thing with the airplane going down is, like, just like amazing you know and and i think that i i think that the way that he handles like all the superhero stuff is great but i, I you know personally at least as far and this is why i'm actually still interested in this sort of franchise is that what i what i really liked about that movie was that it sort of discovered the only real weakness that superman could have outside of kryptonite which is that like in in the name of being himself like he has to give up the one thing that he can't get he can't just beat somebody up and have the woman that he loves and so i was really i was really into that like that was a a, an interesting way to create like an emotional identification with a character who for all intents and purposes is like totally impervious to any attack or injury or anything Yeah, and on that level is a character film but as one friend of mine once put it he said one of the biggest weakness of the film being a comic book movie even if you want to do more character depth you can't have the only action sequences being Superman carrying heavy shit. Is what, is what he said. <laughs> yeah, he said you yeah, could have yeah, called yeah. Superman the moving boy. <laughs> yeah. Because that's really all the action scenes he carries. But anyway, we do need to go on to the next topic here. Uh, and I don't know if they'll spend much top, time on this because this one is still, as far as I know, is still just officially speculation. But there are reports that have been out there that Joseph Gordon Levitt has been, is in discussions for a role in The Dark Knight Rises. Um, now, of course, this creates something of an Inception reunion party. Which is uh, awesome. With, <laughs> with a lot wow. of people. Um, so let, let's go over t- the table. I'm going to start with you, Dennis. If, let's assume for a moment that this is true. Given the connection with Inception and the other characters and everything going on, and just Levitt himself as a performer, is adding him to The Dark Knight Rises a good idea or a bad idea? And if so, do you have any kind of thoughts about who it is he would even be? Um, I really like Joseph Gordon Levitt. Uh, I think he's, he was great in Inception. I thought he was great in Brick. Um, I'm not a big fan of adding all these characters to superhero movies. I, I, I find that most of the time it ruins the what the focus is. Obviously, Chris Nolan is a director I trust, so I'll give him a pass on that. I don't know who he's going to play. People have been throwing around, you know, Dick Grayson slash Robin. But yeah, now, but Nolan I, said he I, would never do that. Yeah, that's what I say. So hopefully that that's not true. Jen. Well, the whole Robin rumor, I think partially at least came from some local news report that mo- that the film was scouting for like Robin's hideout or something. Robin's hideout, really? Something like that. I didn't that. hear this. Tell me yeah, more. Well, that, I forget. It was some local news station um um was reporting on what they had heard from from film scouts. In their 
wherever it was. I don't remember. Where it was. <laughs> they um, heard it from a guy. <laughs> yeah. No, basically, this news station heard from a guy. Heard from a guy that they were looking for like a house for Robin or whatever. So I think that's partially where it came from. Um, I would love to see Joseph Gordon-Levitt in spandex. Um, There seems to be a running theme. (laughs) You know why I love superhero movies, right? That's right. Jennifer's boy crazy. (laughs) Um, I think he's great. Um, I love the idea of of Inception cast members being in every semi-related Chris Nolan movie for the rest of time. Um, so, So... I love that. I hope he is in it. I um, I hope that they give him an interesting role, though, because if he plays like some like uh, some some Hoodlum. sub Michael C. Hall, you know? a TV local TV reporter role. <laughs> yeah, um, I like the idea of him playing maybe a cop. I don't know. Um, Todd. Uh, well, you know, um, Stax over at IGN he wrote an article earlier this week suggesting that he might be Falcone's son. Um, That's and, I, and I don't know, I mean, you know, certainly he doesn't, to my knowledge, he doesn't have any more connection to Christopher Nolan than anybody else. But uh, I trust his insights about that being sort of a potential character that he could play. Um, in terms of casting Joseph Gordon-Levitt in this movie, um, uh, you know, I think that it has kind of always been accepted that Bruce Wayne is kind of... Or you know, like the least interesting character in in almost any of the Batman movies. <laughs> so, um, so like I'm okay with them populating the ensemble with with talented people. Um, you know, I think they just have to be careful and make sure that what those what those other characters are doing is interesting, but not sort of obtrusive to like telling a story. And I think that clearly that was what happened at the end of like the sort of you know, Burton and Schumacher ones where it, it, notwithstanding what you thought of the production design and the direction, like there are just so many characters that there's like nothing for Batman to do. Right. And, and all these other characters have to be connected in an integral way to um, the, not only the story, but the ideas that Nolan is servicing, which I think he did such an amazing job. And I think that's why the dark Knight is so beloved because those characters are not just like plot devices. They are, they are very, you know, like sort of at a genetic level, sort of connected to the themes of that, of the series. And so assuming uh, and giving him certainly the benefit of the doubt that he could do that again with these other characters, like I have no shortage of faith that he'll do a great job. But um, I, I, I agree with Dennis that, you know, you have to, you do have to be a little bit careful, um, when you put this many people in a movie that are so high profile that it's like, well, are they going to have enough to do? Are they just there for stunt casting or, you know, do they actually have something that will connect to the rest of the narrative, I guess. So, uh, either a young Bruce Wayne and some crazy flashback. <laughs> I never thought of that. I, I never. Or, that. or maybe like Alfred's like Batcave butler in training, like <laughs> an intern that he brings in to like you know because it can't be Alfred's an old guy you know and he needs a replacement so he's got to you know and the Batcave has like a lot of like eye robots cleaning. Stuff. <laughs> you know that that reminds me you were talking about uh, Alfred's butler training. I remember. Amongst Roomba? all the, yeah, Roomba, <laughs> I robot. What? the plethora of ridiculous things about the last couple of Batman films before Nolan, I remember the one thing that really stood out to me the most was you basically almost had like a two movie arc story where Batman had to trust this Dick Grayson guy enough to bring him into the fold, let him be Robin, expose his identity, show him the Batcave. Alicia Silverstone shows up and says, hi, I'm Batgirl. And Bruce Wayne says like, okay, sounds good to me. <laughs> You're Batgirl. Which I thought was, but I mean, talk about the multiple characters things and, and Nolan's connection to it. If you look at Inception, how many, literally, even, regardless of how much screen time they had, integral characters are in that film? Eight, nine, ten? Um, and, and Nolan seemed to, to just be able to masterfully handle all these characters, give them all important roles to play, and yet nothing felt out of balance as far as character. If you go back to something like um, Brian Singer's first two X-Men films, you have a, a lot of characters. And yet somehow he's able to balance. But yeah, the superhero film can be very well, can be subject to yeah, yeah, getting Spider-Man, over. Spider-Man 3 is a perfect example. They just threw everyone in that movie. Just 
to have them so they could sell the figures. But I don't know if the problem with Spider Man Three was the number of characters. So it's part the way of it was film was handled. Well, part of it was because th- they couldn't focus on one singular villain and and th- their motivations versus you know Peter Parker slash Spider Man. They just right. had and then they had to tie them in together with these loose. You know, plot devices. Well, I would say that even though I was not a huge fan of like the end result of Spider-Man Three, what I what I actually would argue in that movie's defense is that if you look at the characters and you look at the trajectory of that entire trilogy, like those characters actually fit perfectly into the themes of that trilogy. I mean, the idea of what Sandman has to do, what what his purpose. Is what what purpose he serves in that third film is perfect for the the trajectory of his character throughout those three movies. That doesn't mean the movie's good, but like sort of if you look at the movie architecturally, like it does, like I think it pays off every idea that it, like was sort of set up and developed in the first two movies. The problem is that you know Raimi was imposed uh, that he had to include Venom, which I don't think he wanted to do. And, you know, and then the problem with Raimi was that he wanted to do some crazy Saturday Night Fever crap that was <laughs> awful. And, you know, and there were plenty of real, real problems with that movie. But, <clears throat> you know, I would say that's like sort of like half a, a good example because I do feel like it's, it, it's, it is top heavy with too many characters. But I think that for what they were required to do or what he was required to do as a filmmaker, he actually sort of paid it off and worked him in. Much better than you might have ever expected. Well, look, Nolan has <clears throat> spoken about how, you know, he's acknowledged the, the fact that he knows that he can't let the villains overshadow his mm-hmm. Batman. They certainly saga. have. <laughs> but I think it's something that he's certainly thinking about. I don't think we're in danger of, of him uh, losing his his Batman saga to whatever crazy kooky villains uh, pop in. Pop in. Yeah. Right. Well, I would just say, I would just say, you know, as far as just Gordon Levitt is concerned, I would be interested to see um, if he plays another character like Arthur in this movie. Which is, mm. you know, the thing about Arthur is that he was so utilitarian in that movie, and he never tried to get be any bigger than he was needed in Inception. Right. Which I really, really admire both of the actor and the way the character is written. But I'll be interested to see if. Nolan doesn't want to throw him a little more of a bone and say, like, here's a bigger character, even though it, that may be exactly the scale of character that is needed for the movie. All right, let's move on to this because we have a few more topics to cover here. Uh, it was announced this week that Ben Affleck has taken on a new project. And of course, Ben Affleck is uh, now really more director Ben Affleck than actor Ben Affleck, having done Gone Baby Gone. And of course, this year's one of the films that I thought should have snuck into the number 10 or number 9 spot in the uh, Best Picture run for, for the town. There's some debate on that, obviously. But he's taken on a, the new project, Argo, with, which, if I'm pulling this off the top of my head correctly, is basically based off the true story, a political scandal of the American government trying to sneak people out of... Tehran. Tehran, uh, from the Canadian embassy, and, and based on that. Now, here's why I found this news interesting, is I remember watching The Town, and I want to get your guys' reaction to this. I remember watching Town and thinking, I love this film, this is fantastic, man, he's doing great. But man, tone-wise and flavor-wise, this is very familiar to Gone Baby Gone, a kind of Boston-based thing mm-hmm. with the, the crooks and the cops and blah, blah. I wonder how, and I remember thinking this a few weeks ago, I wonder how Affleck will do if he you know, stretches himself beyond that sort of thing. Argo certainly looks like a project that will take him beyond that. From what you've seen, Jen, we'll start with you. From what you've seen in Gone Baby Gone and from what you've seen in, in the town, is Affleck's success simply because he, I mean, he's a Boston guy. This was his sort of thing. Yeah. Or do you th- have you seen enough out of him that you think he can you succeed know, beyond that? I think directorially he's shown a facility with the thriller genre, which is why I think Argo sounds like it could be a, a really good move for him to make his third directing effort. Um, he definitely needs to get away from Boston. And I think going to Tehran is pretty, it's, it's pretty far. Yeah. So, so I'm looking forward to the, the, the very basic premise that we've all heard sounds, you know, like, I, I think it sounds more like, um, uh, the kind of film we should expect from its producers 